welcome everyone to uh, this uh, Digital Trust and Security uh, seminar series. Um, I'm Professor Rachel Gibson, I'm Professor in Politics, uh, and I will be chairing the session. And it's my great pleasure to introduce a colleague uh, from uh, University of Oxford, Professor Philip Howard. Um, uh, Phil has a, a, a long sort of history of studying the topic that he'll be talking about today, um, or about uh, the impact of, of, sort of digital technology on political life. Um, Phil uh, is a, he's professor of internet studies at uh, Balliol College uh, at the University of Oxford um, and also director of the Oxford Internet Institute. Um, as I said, his uh, career has centered on looking at the effects of digital media on political life um, in national, various national contexts and also cross-nationally. Um, and he has focused in particular, I think, on questions about how it can be used perhaps for the good and also how it can be used for the not so good purposes. Um, so he has projects that reflect this work around digital activism and also computational propaganda. Um, he has, he's the author of several uh, books and also research articles um, on the topic. Um, going back in time to his work on the managed citizen through to Pax Technica and now his latest book, Lie Machines, uh, which uh, focuses on how to save democracy from uh, troll armies, deceitful robots, junk new operations and political operatives. Uh, so this is going to be the subject of his talk today, which I think we've shortened to just how to save democracy from social media. <laughs> so uh, with that um, not insignificant task, I will hand over to, to Phil uh, and then we'll have a series of uh, questions uh, at the end of it, actually. I think the chat facility is, uh, is open for you to ask questions. I should say as well that the, uh, the, the seminar is actually sponsored both by the digital trust and se uh, security uh, theme and also the citizen government theme of, of digital futures. Um, so with that uh, intro, I will, I will hand over to Phil. Uh, thanks very much, Phil. Mm -hmm. Away you go. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel, for that generous introduction. Is it sound OK? Everything. Wonderful. Um, well, it's uh, a pleasure to join you today. I have uh, about 25 minutes worth of material uh, uh, that I'd like to run through you. It's, it's always an honor to present stuff to an expert audience. Um, there'll be several different kinds of evidence I'm going to play with as I make my argument. And I'll, I'll say a little bit about what the, the OII is and what our, what our team does. I'll try to keep an eye on the chat as we go. If you have any questions uh, as I'm uh, as I'm speaking, I'll try to address. And maybe after 25 minutes or so, we'll we'll pause and open it up to a, a small group or a big group, big group conversation. Let me begin with a screen share. And uh, there we go. So uh, what I'm going to talk about today is um, is I think two of the significant chunks of evidence, involves two of the significant chunks of evidence in the Lie Machines book. And uh, so much has changed since the book itself was published, right? It's now four months, well, three months old, and it's already uh, a world, seems a world away. So I'm going to end with some of the material that we've been producing here um, at Oxford on COVID misinformation, which didn't make it into the book, but I think is still, unfortunately, part, uh, fits within the theory frame, uh, the theory frame um, of my arguments in, in lie machines. Let me also offer that if you're still interested in this topic, by the time I finished uh, speaking, I've um, collected a discount code from the publisher's website. Uh, here it is, Yale University Press. Uh, there is a UK website uh, for ordering in country, and this code will provide 30% off the discount, uh, off the, the cover title, uh, should you still be interested in, uh, in what, what I've been doing. I'm going to say a little bit about the OII and our computational propaganda research team, um, talk about the, the definition that we have for what a lie machine is, review some data and evidence, talk a little bit about what's changed over the summer, over the last few months, and then hopefully uh, the narrative of this arc should leave everybody depressed for about 10, 15 minutes and then build everybody back up with the strategies for, for how to fix public life. My own team, the Computational Propaganda Lab, work, um, works on, on, works with significant amounts of uh, data, uh, big data perhaps, if you will. Well, and our goal is to apply big data and analytic techniques to increase civic engagement, solve public problems, to apply what we know from social data science uh, to try to address public policy issues. And over the last few years, this has increasingly meant trying to protect elections uh, or protect 
other democratic processes. The OII is an unusual department. We're in the social sciences division at Oxford, but we're about a third computer scientists and a third social scientists and a third humanists. And our, our computer scientists do much more than tool building. They, they have to learn the social theory and our, our humanists and our social scientists have to either learn to code or appreciate the craft of code. And it's this kind of interaction that lets us deal with uh, significant um, problems, uh, framing in, in public life, uh, the right to be forgotten, AI ethics, data ethics, uh, this computational propaganda, um, the process for, for studying computational propaganda are, are the kinds of things, these are the kinds of things that we're um, well equipped to deal with, I think, and because the university has forced us to collaborate in interesting ways. The, the team that I work with is between nine and 12 uh, students and postdocs at any given time, depending on where people are in their doctoral project. Uh, we tend to only study countries, of course, where we have an expert who knows the language and knows the political culture. Um, that's both a, an opportunity and it's a constraint for us, but on the whole, most of us end up studying several countries at once. Several of the team have become heavily involved in civil society engagement initiatives. Uh, those initiatives are supported for the most part by the Armidiar Foundation and the basic science of what we do. Started with some support from the NSF um, seven years ago, and uh, now it's primarily an ERC award that has, uh, has given us the structure. Now, let me say a little bit about what I mean by a live machine, how I define it, and of course, touch on some of the other terms we all use in studying this stuff. When I refer to a live machine, I refer to the social and technical mechanism for putting a lie, a falsehood, a, an untrue claim into the service of some political ideology. And these two parts are crucial. And this is what I think makes the, the definition um, unique. I, know, I don't think it makes sense to talk about modern politics now, the structure of public life, without some room, making room for the technical side, the structured side, the algorithmic side, and the social organization. I think we can be socially overdetermined. We can be technologically overdetermined. Uh, my goal here is, trying to, is in trying to frame this as both a, a social and a technical problem. I use the term computational propaganda to refer to uh, the, the system that generates algorithmically customized content, delivering it perhaps um, to the particular people who will be most influenced by it. This is content that's um, organizationally directed, right? Somebody's purposefully behind us, pushing it forward. It's a motive uh, rather than rational uh, in content, and it tends to provoke, provoke action. I think unlike the traditional definite or the kind of propaganda we used to see or used to have, it's, it's micro-targeted, right? It's directed at us in particular. It's not dropped from airplanes or broadcast over lar to the large swaths of the population. Disinformation tends to be misinformation that is purposefully dis designed to deceive, right? That it's been crafted to, to um, crafted with a lie. Uh, misinformation is a lot more subtle, and maybe during the Q and A we can talk about what misinformation even looks like. Uh, at the end of the summer going into the fall, it, for the most part, it has meant false but unintentionally produced misunderstandings. So when uh, one of our relatives forwards content that they didn't actually proof and the impact is, is it's not clearly, it's not clear who, who gets credit for the impact of misinformation. These days, the misinformation is incredibly subtle, especially around COVID. It involves um, slight uh, photographs of the right subject, but taken at the wrong time. It involves very, uh, it, it's, uh, it takes a rhetorician to be able to inter interpret um, the most recent forms of misinformation that we catch. And the book itself is just is the ch major chapters are broken up into a chapter on the production side of misinformation. There's one on the distribution side of misinformation and there's one on the marketing side. The sort of the aftermarket that makes sure uh, a nugget of misinformation or a story hits home, finds the right audience. Now I'll say a little bit more about COVID misinfo um, towards the end of my, my presentation, but I'd like to start here because this is certainly one of the most complex, all encompassing um, packages, uh, misinformation packages I, we've ever seen in our years of study. It involves uh, complex myths around 5G, uh, a long-standing story that the government is trying to put RFID chips into your arms. 
Uh, there's the cult of personality around Bill Gates and, and uh, the conspiracy of billionaires. There's the accusation of junk science uh, and the, the actually a fairly long-standing social movement uh, against vaccines. Um, and, and this more recent, um, I think 2019-2020 2020 movement against 5G technology. So the, the, the special towers, broadcast towers that are killing all the bees, supposedly, or having an impact on, on other forms of wildlife. And so there's multiple threads of longstanding myth that got tied in to a COVID-related conspiracy to create a vaccine that might um, turn you into a monkey or hurt you in some way or uh, put a chip in you. Uh, that would make you taggable, searchable, uh, trackable through the latest 5G technologies. When we started this work, um, most of our work was on Twitter and we've stopped that. I can tell you, we, uh, I can, we can have that methodology question towards the end, uh, method methodology discussion at the end if you like. But when we began, we worked mostly on Twitter um, because their, their API feed was um, fairly reliable, it gave us a good, a good volume of content. Um, this particular, uh, the bear might give it away, but it was fairly easy at that point to identify which accounts were highly automated. Um, they would work in English on, uh, on soap opera plots or football scores, and then accidentally tweet in Cyrillic for a little bit and then move on to a po political topic. Uh, and so we almost, was almost a hand heuristic, hand based heuristic to identify accounts that had huge volumes of content or massive following lists, but, but weren't actually following anybody else or produced tens of thousands of uh, tweets a week at a, a pace that no, no human would naturally produce. Early on in our work, uh, we would often start with Trump's follower list when looking for automation. I don't mean this as a particular political jab. I mean simply that he, that his follower list has an immense number of bots, highly automated accounts tracking him. And you've seen these accounts. They, they don't have any pictures or they use numbers uh, instead of names as identifiers uh, until one day when they wake up simultaneously and began pu begin pushing a particular story. Um, this is one of our early examples. Uh, again, a story that didn't happen, right? covered on Russia Today. Uh, Muslim women in hijab storming the beach uh, in beaches of Spain or running across the border, breaking through the border between um, Morocco and into Spain. Events that didn't happen, photos that, that were doctored, um, but were pushed by highly automated accounts at a sensitive, sensitive moment in Europe's con conversation about uh, political Islam. At this point, we've done uh, detailed reports on dozens of different elections and countries around the world. Um, much of the activity has concerned Russia, but I'll say a little bit about that. That's another thing that's changed over the summer. And when we work, I think part of what's made, uh, made the, the, uh, the work both fun and productive has been marrying the qualitative, um, the deep embedded field work with the people who build these campaigns with the large computational studies that generate significant amounts of data. In fact, it's often, I would go further to say that that you need the qualitative work to make the computational work interpretable. And for the most part, we have been focusing on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube, and we have tried to work on WhatsApp. Today, our sort of methodology challenges are with Instagram. Uh, I can say a little about Tinder later if you like. TikTok, uh, still YouTube is a challenge, and WhatsApp. So the, the basic science of this is also changing and evolving as the platforms change. Or, or it's as the platforms change and as users move across platforms. Now, let me give you a taste of, from, of the, some of the material from one of the chapters. This is um, uh, an analysis we did for the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence of the, the, only, most, the only fully attributed data set of Russian-backed accounts active in the United States, posing as fake Americans um, beginning from 2016 uh, or, who, or who were known to be active during the election in, in the election in 2016. Uh, as you may remember, in mid 2018, the, the major firms were called to testify to the Senate, and as part of that, uh, as part of that process, the, each of the firms gave over a chunk of data of what they knew about Russian involvement in the, the U.S. election. Uh, 
I've got three fairly straightforward charts here, and this is a simple one laying out the day-to-day -day activity of the three and a half thousand fake Russian Facebook accounts. The, the first few conclusions are fairly straightforward. Uh, they are um, one that the, the bursts of activity, the peak of activity uh, lines up with busy nights in the election cycle. The night of presidential debates, there's a burst of Russian and Russian account activity. The night of the election, there's a burst of Russian activity. The, the electoral calendar and the, the flows of content uh, match quite closely. Well, what's interesting to me for this figure is that the bulk of Russian activity from these accounts occurs after November 2016, right? It's, it's the far right side of the graphic. It's, it's almost as if they, they didn't stop uh, once, once they were outed. Um, they doubled down or hired more staff or became more productive. It's, it's not clear what. It's one, thing, one of the limits we have in our research is um, to be able to figure out um, the, the why part of this. We also found that much of the account activity occurred much earlier than we expected, as early as 2015. So they started well before we uh, knew they were active. They went on much later than expected, well into 2018. And the drop off on the far right is simply the part that involves, uh, it was, was the cutoff, the point at which the firms decided to um, hand over data. And the second figure I'm going to offer is uh, a plot of two forms of data. We have data on YouTube search, uh, Facebook ads, Facebook posts, Instagram posts, and Twitter posts. Google gave over data in uh, some of its search data, but they decided to provide it uh, in PDF form, non-machine readable form. And uh, we don't know why they did that, did that. It's not like the Senate was going to print, print the Google submission, but for uh, you know, I would almost, it must've been purposeful because the form doesn't, the data doesn't exist in PDF form. Some in Google engineer would have had to make a political decision to provide PDFs, but we have not played with that data. We played with the Instagram and the Facebook ads. Uh, for this graphic um, to demonstrate that overall, the circulation of political Facebook ads is fairly minor part of the Russian strategy especially compared with Instagram organic content. Now keep in mind, Instagram is a fairly closed platform. Uh, Facebook doesn't really share data and Instagram, which is owned by Facebook, never shares any data. So I offer this graphic uh, as evidence that not only was Russian activity much greater on the platform we have no sight of, but this platform is particularly important for young people. This is where the young people migra have migrated to over the last few years. And uh, that's also where the Mush Russians migrated to. We have no sight of what goes on, very little sight of what goes on on Instagram, but that's a significant platform for misinformation now. Then there are the themes and, and many of you will know this stuff too. Um, the Russians picked on particularly polarizing themes that are relevant for the US in the US context. Uh, Black Lives Matter uh, content, African-American history, um, messaging that was geared towards um, discouraging the vote, right? If you're black, no white politician will ever represent you well. Um, the best thing you can do is, is boycott the vote. Don't vote. Or messages like, um, uh, if you're Democrat and African-American, you can text message your vote in, or you can vote on Friday instead of Tuesday. There's, there's a series of these kinds of messages designed to discourage certain communities from voting. It's a significant amount of content uh, that's appealing to uh, the far, far right in the United States, usually around guns, um, ab abortion, um, uh, Tea Party kinds of themes. And more recently in the sort of 2017, 2018 area of the data, there's much more polarizing content around uh, political Islam, uh, Latin American, uh, uh, Latino identity, um, Hispanic identity, Mexican American identity, with a similar kind of messaging. Um, mainstream white politicians can't represent you. The best thing you can do is not vote, boycott. So that's sort of what we learned in in early on in the project with the large data that we that we um, large data sets that we play with. I'd like to say a little bit now about the comparative work looking across countries and some of the big picture global trends. After doing this work in 2016, we decided to make an inventory of the countries in which there was organized misinformation campaigns. So 
not lone wolf hackers or individual uh, far-right extremists, but organized movements with um, telephones and staff and hiring hiring plans and performance bonuses, sort of in the, in the sociological sense, uh, formal organizations. In 2017, we found these kinds of organizations operating in 28 countries. The number grew again in 2018. Uh, in 2019, there were 70 countries uh, with organized misinformation campaigns uh, actively running. We're almost done our, um, our 2020 report and uh, we're into the high 80s. It's, I'm almost not sure we'll do it again next year because the punchline has been delivered. In authoritarian regimes, it tends to be military units that have been retasked, uh, given, given duties related to social media messaging. In democracies, it's fairly straightforward PR firms. Uh, it's regular political parties that uh, do this kind of work. They, it's almost as if there's organizational learning flowing from authoritarian regimes that have the big money to, to um, spend on this stuff uh, into democracies. And that's, um, that's why we see no, so much more of it now in, during our elections. One thing that's changed in the last few years is that, is that we've, seen more, um, we've seen more copycat agencies like the Internet Research Agency in Russia. Uh, Venezuela now has one, the Saudis have one, uh, Pakistan, India, Iran, all have made significant government investments in official agencies that, that do this work. They don't all operate in English, an English language social media, but in the last year, China has really arrived as an information, as a misinformation superpower. Um, they, for the longest time, we, we sort of knew they had some capacity, but, but didn't seem that interested in shaping public opinion in, in, in English language social media. I'd say starting last October, November, we saw more activity in English on social media platforms that are actually banned in China. Um, and this was related to Hong Kong protests trying to uh, shape, shape what the world thinks about what's going on in Hong Kong. And then much more recently around COVID, trying to shape the stories we, uh, we tell about where COVID came from and um, what's, uh, what the um, causes and consequences of it are. Um, this is a simple chart I, uh, I grabbed from a, a colleague at BuzzFeed who did a similar kind of study, just mapping which kinds of information operations can be attributed to regular PR firms, large commercial organizations that are in every world, every, um, every global capital, every world city. Significant number of them now have the kinds of services that we've talked about. Well, three months ago, we started doing a regular, a weekly tracking, um, a weekly, weekly tracking exercise to try to compare the reach of these particularly state-backed agencies, uh, Russia Today, CGTN in China, to see in theory, you know, how many social media account users they could reach with their content. Uh, early on, we produced this very simple chart, um, adding up all of the uh, different followers over all the different platforms that major news organizations use. Uh, all in all, in some of the state-backed agencies primarily Russia and China, can reach almost a billion social media user accounts a week with content. That content tends not to be circulated as far as high quality professional content from the BBC or CNN, but it does tend to get more engagement. So people are more likely to engage with junk news. If, uh, those are organizations based in the West uh, and they tend to engage more with state backed content than they do with um, that from professional news organizations. Over the long term, uh, I would say that it's safe to assume that every national security crisis, every budget bill, uh, every tax issue, every complex humanitarian disaster, every school shooting, every, every kind of crisis will come with some kind of automated campaign for it or against it or blaming some social group or crediting some politician. I, I believe this is a normal part of public life now. I think we've spent most of our time for the last few years thinking about what the Russian government is up to. China has now demonstrated a, a, a clear interest in shaping public opinion in, in English, and there are other regimes eager, eager to do this, this work as well. I think that we're going to see more and more issue-specific moments in which, which automation and misinformation uh, 
pops on the horizon. It won't just be about elections. That's that's what we've studied, mostly because that's that's a, a way to organize a research team around a date, right? That you can that you can plan your paper papers and data collection to. But if a lobbyist working on a particular issue can use this toolkit to get relief from the legislature, they'll try. I don't believe we've seen artificial intelligence behind much of any of the campaigning we've seen so far. But again, you know, this is driven by money in important ways. And um, the US, US presidential election years are the big years where millions of dollars goes into developing new techniques for public opinion manipulation. If a lobbyist can figure out how to use data from your smart refrigerator or your smart, tele, uh, smart um, TV and map it with social media content to design a, a face that you'll respond to with an argument that, that you'll be sympathetic to, they'll spend that money and they'll try those experiments and they'll A-B test things so quickly uh, that they'll be able to hone the tool um, in fairly short order. I, I don't think that's I don't think even we'll face that in 2020, but it, it is on the horizon. Uh, it, it is on the horizon. I also think that the deepest, most existential threat here to democracy is about undermining the role of science in public life, because so many of these campaigns are about getting voters to uh, go with their gut on issues and to be suspicious of experts, to question the science. And it's not critical thinking um, the way we might think of critical thinking. It's, it's simply about not accepting evidence. Um, in recently, some of the uh, Russian back to accounts that we've tracked have started working on um, the tobacco and smoking. Uh, there's been medical consensus for 70 years that smoking causes cancer. Uh, there's, there is no, there's no, you don't need to teach any controversy around that. There's scientific consensus, but um, some of these accounts will say, it depends on your gender, or it may depend on your brand, or have you seen this link uh, designed to undermine public confidence in the medical research around, around tobacco. Uh, as a fun project, we decided to um, try to track the flat earth movement, just to see if structurally or rhetorically it operated in different ways from some of the other movements we tracked. And it, it was fairly, fairly clear fairly early on that it was much more similar, much more alike than an, an outlier anti-vax movements, there's a range of, there's a range of social media campaigns that, that have the same structure, have the same arc, narrative arc, as something launched by the Internet Research Agency or the, the Chinese government. So um, that is the, that is the trough, right, of um, the evidence that I wanted to work through with you. Let me say something now about the strategy and how I, what I think we can do to rebuild. I genuinely believe that this is a moment where uh, research, where your research and our research makes a difference, um, has a direct role in public life and uh, needs to be real time, right? Because the, the times in which we can make a difference are those in which we can work with policymakers to impress upon social media firms that their engineers must act in time for a voting day, in time for a serious issue to be discussed in parliament. Universities still on the whole have that neutral platform. I would say Cambridge Analytica as a firm has eroded that somewhat for some of us, but um, on the whole, doing good social data science and collecting large amounts of evidence is, is an important part of what we can contribute now to shoring up democratic conversations. Now I have a few policy ideas about here about um, things that I think we could do, should do to help, um, help uh, restore public life. Let me say a little bit about the first, the idea of um, reporting an ultimate beneficiary. This, uh, this is an idea that I borrowed from the, uh, or poached from the Blood Diamonds campaign. You may remember from 25, 30 years ago. This was a simple, straightforward idea that if an average consumer was told that, that the diamond they were purchasing came from the nastiest pits of uh, slave mines in Africa, most consumers would not purchase those diamonds. Similarly, I think it should be possible to ask any particular device that we have in our household to report the ultimate beneficiary of the data that it's collecting. If it's collecting data on us and sending that data to third parties, I believe we should be able to ask it to tell us which third parties, which political parties are playing with our information. Now, 
the other steps here, and I can go through them if, if we're all interested, but the other steps are extensions of that, logical extensions of that. If we can get a list of the ultimate beneficiaries of our personal behavioral data, um, we should be able to add groups to that, right? Um, I, for one, probably would add my data to um, an NHS study of um, COVID behavioral patterns. If I could volunteer that data, I would, but it's not just about medical data. If I wanted to donate my data to the Bodleian or the National Library System or the ERC, uh, I should be able to. I think the best data on public life, on, on public problems, is not in public hands, right? It's, it's not in the British Library, it's not in the BOD, it's not in the Library of Congress, it's in private hands in Silicon Valley. And bringing some of that data back into the public life has, has got to be the major institutional fix that we need to, we need to undertake. We as a team um, often get worn down. Um, it's not clear that we're always winning in doing this work and exposing some of the, the misinformation campaigns that we catch. I'm sorry, Jeannie, your answer was correct, but Kevin shouted his incorrect answer over yours, so he gets his points. I'd say at this point, we're, we're still very much fueled by faith that it is worth demonstrating truths. It is worth catching out lies. It is worth asking, expecting social media platforms to, to rise above their poor design choices um, and to think of ways of designing for consensus building and empathy and, and undo the, the designs they've chosen that I think promote polarization and the flow of politically motivated lies. So I'm gonna stop the screen share. Mm -hmm. Thank you all for questions. I noticed a few pop up. And uh, Rachel, if you'd like to come back and highlight some, or we can we can jump into the chat. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Thanks, Philip. Um, I could give you a, a round of applause yeah. on behalf on our behalf. Um, yeah. So there has been a few that have popped into the um, chat, and also there's a couple that I kind of have myself, which build on actually one of the questions that has popped up. So um, Justina had raised the prospect or the question about the future of misinformation activities and how things will develop in, in you know later down the line and I would sort of supplement that perhaps by asking recently I attended a, a talk and there was some discussion about how obviously these campaigns are moving on and they're becoming more sophisticated and more nuanced and uh, is it your perception in a way that the kind of sort of the 2016 election was a sort of blunt a slightly blunt instrument and that when we look at 2020 you know, we will see increasing sophistication of these techniques. And one of the points I think that was made in the, the paper that I heard was that uh, they're being more tailored now. These misinformation campaigns are actually sort of being tailored more to the context in which uh, they're being uh, directed. So if there are certain views, you know, the, that are kind of intolerant or more extreme on certain issues, those will be kind of part of the messaging in a, in a given country uh, and they'll pick another sort of target in another country. So sort of combining Justine's question with my question is sort of what, what's the future, you know, for these misinformation campaigns and, and are, you know, in what way will they become or do, will they be, uh, we're assuming they'll become more sophisticated. Is that, is that, a, is that yeah. a presumption that is correct? I, I think that's right. I think both of you have the right instinct here that um, I would say, I would say that the 2016 intervention was, um, you know, I think the blunt interventions were actually what Russia uh, attempted in Ukraine and Hungary and uh, Poland 2014 to 2016. By 2016, they were able to uh, focus misinformation campaigns at, at swing states. So I agree that the, the trend is towards more focus and concentration. By 2016, they were at least able to, decor um, uh, to direct the misinformation campaigns to the states that made a difference in that, that um, I, not, ridiculous electoral college system, right? That prevents, um, prevents public opinion from um, being co collated in sensible ways. And I would say that in terms of trends, the several of the platforms have done some creative things to try to um, in their content moderation policy policies and as a result some of the extremists have gone off to start their own platforms so one of the trends is that now if if twitter seems too liberal or youtube seems too liberal there's an alt-right video sharing platform and an alt-right um, twitter 
So, so in that sense, things are also becoming more, more concentrated. In, a, in another way, I would say um, that there's, there's still room for the, <clears throat> there's still room for, for the qualitative expert to study misinformation trends. And, and, and here's, here's why. I think the Russian style of doing misinformation ha has been, has involved creating, <clears throat> excuse me, um, creating legends or profiles that last for a long time. They, they last for five or six years. They're subtle and nuanced. They're maintained. Uh, dozens of them are maintained by one person who carefully shepherds the content and grooms it. And at the right moment, they start being active. The Chinese style of misinformation, which we've just seen in the last year, it's quite different. It is. It involves simply purchasing forty thousand fake accounts right now and sending the message. Sometimes they they don't even try um, to do photos or make any personal history to the account. So there's there's one sort of long term craft. It's the it's the whiskey that, that sits there for fifty years and then it's you know then it gets sophisticated and complex, and then there's the simple. Here's forty thousand accounts, and we get we get them going. So there's there's already styles of misinformation in, in what these two regimes do, and I suspect there will be other other styles that evolve. I, I don't know what they'll be, but but that is what makes it intellectually interesting, at least. Thank you. Um, so just jumping on to Rachel, uh, Katz had a question. Right. She's asking about the is there anything Great. or the the Tinder research that OII has been doing in relation to this topic. If you could talk a bit more about that. Certainly, that, that was not an in-depth research project. This was a study of when we were working on the 2017 election in this country, um, some of our researchers found a set of Tinder bots that would flirt and then talk about Jeremy Corbyn. And one of the reasons we know about the campaign is because the, the campaign managers who paid for the bots to be coded and set up went on to Twitter after the election and thanked their Tinder bots and identified the districts where they thought the Tinder bots had given them just a few a fractional percentage points of an edge to help their candidates win. So it, it wasn't a major project. It was an example where, you know, we, we got it from the horse's mouth. It, they said they thank, acknowledged and gave credit to the Tinder bot as having, having had a role in their the candidate success. Mm -hmm. And I guess does that brings up the question as well as the extent to which um, the idea of uh, this, you know, that this, this, these techniques could actually turn an election, I suppose. Um, it seems uh, it, it's perhaps inflating it, it, their claims, but I just wondered if in the sort of course of your research, you know, there's been a sort of lot of discussion about, uh, you know, this can out, help shape the outcome. And from the just taking sort of an, an overall kind of look at the work that you've done, do you think that's credible in some way that even if perhaps not now, again, down the line, could there be some sort of element that these techniques could actually determine an outcome? And how would that think, actually happen? I think um, for those, of those of us who might self-identify as political scientists, I don't think we'll ever have um, a linear model for how a tweet shapes a voter uh, or, or changes a voter's mind. I, I don't think we'll ever have those kinds of models. Um, that said, I do believe that there have been outcomes, political outcomes that have been shaped by misinformation and automation. Um, I think the Brexit vote in this country was one of them. I think uh, Trump's election in 2016 was another one. Um, now those are those are sort of big claims that have large amounts of data about them. I can talk about in the book. There are also some very important long tail effects, regardless of what you think about any particular voting outcome. There's some long tail effects that that we do need to talk about. Um, it's pretty clear over multiple countries now that um, prominent female journalists, women politicians, um, feminist intellectuals are especially soft targets for misinformation, uh, aggressive misinformation campaigns, and that it's, it's fairly easy to drive women out of public life with these campaigns. And this is, this is an observation across multiple, multiple countries. You can still measure um, the long tail, the number of people in the UK who think they'll be saving, what was it, 200 million pounds a week for the NHS, uh, you can still measure in public opinion surveys the number of young Americans who think Hillary Clinton was involved in something in that pizzeria in Washington, D.C., that there's something still we need to learn. Right? And um, 
seems to me within six months of the vote, it was just over, just under 20% of young, skews young, who, who retain some bit of doubt or uncertainty um, because, of a, because of a misinformation campaign. So these things last a, a long time. And, uh, and um, I think, unfortunately, um, President Trump's um, the misinformation around COVID and how to deal with it, uh, again, has demonstrated multiple times over in many different ways uh, how misunderstanding and powerful use of social media can have um, very bad ill effects, uh, health effects, right, kill. Yeah, I think that's an important distinction, I suppose, between the short-term vote impact and this longer-term sort of trust a question and um, the idea of the long tail. Um, if, if, we of, ever, if we were ever run out of questions, would you try answering that? Because I would love, <laughs> I would love to hear what your answer is on that, on the, on the, the vote. <laughs> yes, well, maybe after the talk, we can kind of take, take that one up again. <laughs> I always try to sort of see if I can pose it to other people because I, I agree with you. It's a, it's, a, it's a kind of what they call a wicked problem or a wicked mm -hmm. question to be able to actually methodologically try and answer that. Um, but it has stimulated a few more uh, questions coming in. Um, and there's a couple actually which are linked together, um, which get to this question perhaps of the solutions or how we could approach trying to tackle this um, with um, kind of information literacy or some kind of sort of system of fact checking. So um, uh, uh, we've had one question, which is Ayush, I think, which is asking how could we equip children, young adults, who would uh, possibly face more sophisticated misinformation campaigns uh, to be well equipped not to be swayed by them. Um, so uh, there's a sort of question about how we can kind of educate or what's you know some of the ways in which we could protect uh, or immunize people against this kind of information uh, pollution. And then I think there's a second one Justina actually has asked, which is you know about how is there any research into how online information misinformation, sorry, affects those who are not technologically literate or not aware of how social media works. I think those two things are, are kind of interlinked. So I don't know if you want to kind of pick, pick one area starting somewhere. Hello? Is everything okay? Yeah, yeah. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Um, okay. Thank you. I was thanking Ayush for that question because understanding the impact on children and, and youth is, is certainly one of the next big big things we need to tackle. And I'm afraid I'm not sure what the answer is. I think this, there's some evidence that young people get um, less news, but more frequent news, right? That they spend more time on their mobile phone doing quick checks of headlines than we ever do as adults. But on the whole, don't sit down and read a 2000 word investigative uh, journalism, piece of investigative journalism. Uh, there's some evidence that young people are more cynical about the sources of information and are more likely, maybe more likely to believe uh, a, a conspiracy theory, but less likely to share it than some uh, older uh, technology users. So I, I'm not sure that we know quite yet, but I agree with the instinct that um, education and decent critical thinking skills um, and um, civics curriculum is still vital. You know, in an important way, there's long term, there's a long term solution that involves um, technology literacy. And both the platforms and public institutions and, and universities have to deliver on that agenda. There's also the short term and the proximate, right? Uh, the proximate problem is that Facebook and Twitter and Instagram serve large amounts of misinformation in the two or three days before people vote. Uh, when people are really making up their mind and, and actually thinking about politics. Most of the rest of the, the year, most people are not, they're using Tinder to flirt, right? They're not trying to meet Jeremy Corbyn. Um, the, the, it's only in those days before people vote that a difference makes, that uh, you can make a difference. And that's when the junk really flourishes. Yeah, and just, I think also there's another um, question which is linked into this, which is from uh, Grant uh, Allen. And he asks about, um, the idea of, um, I think it's probably relating to possibly not quite fact checking, but a sort of traffic lighting kind of system um, for misinformation, um, asking whether or not uh, it would work to have post some kind of authority score um, that could be used to classify them into different uh, types of opinion, news, uh, social 
um, and then if so, who, who could provide or should provide the score or the classification? Or is this too late? Is it just too late to try something like this? I, I don't think it's too late. And I think the question, I mean, I think the, the ideas here are what the firms are, are playing with. It's, it's what they're trying. Um, in the US, there's a significant firm, NewsGuard is, is one of the services. I believe they're a for-profit firm that started as a nonprofit that are provide browser embeds that will help do this, provide this authority score. Um, I, think, I think part of the solution involves making sure the platforms provide cues, context cues to users, and that government is used to regulating edge cases. So we don't want, or I wouldn't want government creating those authority scores, but if there are clearly a set of news sources that are white supremacist, extremist, or foreign, or should be foreign registered, uh, you know, what's the phrase, uh, registered foreign lobbyists, right? Um, that creates a blacklist, right? That the firms need to need to be able to respect. And the diligence, if these if these edge cases um, of, that are that are genuine national security threats, if they come up with new URLs or relaunch and rebrand uh, and repackage their content the firms need to be diligent about keeping track of it, right? It's, it shouldn't just be, uh, it shouldn't be a whack-a-mole project on behalf of the public agencies. So I think the answer is yes. Um, and I think you need several different ways, several different authority scores to, to make it work. And just, uh, I have a question actually from Emma uh, Barrett and Emma is um, posing, I, th I think, I'll paraphrase, I think I'm getting it right, is that about the amplification of misinformation. So I guess this is by, by political figures, um, so not kind of nameless trolls or bots, but um, when political politicians or sort of established kind of uh, organizations perhaps amplify misinformation or disinformation to, to their own ends. And she's asking, do you think this is going to ultimately backfire on them? Because uh, the, as the electorate becomes more aware of how information is manipulated. Um, I think that is also going to make a great political science study. And <laughs> I don't mean that as a dodge, but I mean because um, for the last couple of years, um, Trump has become an example. It, it's not clear what, how Trump, what kind of example Trump would be to answer this question. He does not seem to have stopped or offered apologies or retracted on the multiple layers of misinformation. And I would say there's several other political leaders like this. Um, Bolsonaro in Brazil has the same kinds of attributes. Um, the president of the Philippines has the same kinds, of, same kinds of attributes in terms of saying things, but not suffering from any backfire or consequences. Now, I do think that over time, the public has become more sophisticated um, in part because journalists are getting better at covering this stuff. So, 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 and because the firms are flagging misinformation now that, that threatens public life. So I would agree that maybe over the course of time, there'll be some backfire in the sense that the electorate will be more sophisticated. I suppose we'll see in November, right? It's been four years. And I, I would agree that Trump support has whittled away. It's, I think in part, it would be because of the misinformation um, that he's generated, but I'm not sure, I'm not 100% sure that, that he's gonna suffer any consequences for it. Yeah, and I think it gets to this narrative, doesn't it? A bit about this kind of idea of domestication of these tactics and kind of they become sort of normalized within an election um, yeah. and whether or not that's the kind of new trend um, that we might sort of see and that the, almost like the bar has been lowered. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm, I'm Canadian, lived in Toronto for many years, and uh, at one point we had a mayor who did very similar things, right? And mm -hmm. um, so now there's provincial leaders and governors and down ballot uh, leaders who, who do this kind of thing too. Yeah, and we have a question which is actually sounds more sort of, I don't know if it's philosophical, but it's slightly, uh, can, I'll throw this one out because I don't know if I'd be able to answer it, so I'm going to throw it to you, Phil. Um, but it's about the idea of people still believing uh, the misinformation. So uh, that's the notion that misinformation is not actually misinformation, but is truth uh, in their eyes. And uh, they just ask about whether or not you have any statistics or empirical data about subjective perceptions of, of truth, what they call mm. truthness. Um, Truthiness. Yeah. So you can come. I think um, 
I think it is possible to um, measure public opinion, public understanding of an issue. And you could probably measure, um, this is a survey project for somebody else, right? You can probably count the number of ask people if they think smoking causes cancer. <clears throat> and um, if, if the people who answered, no, it doesn't count cause cancer, they're demonstrably wrong, right? Um, I think we could debate uh, what truth means uh, as, as, uh, as philosophers, but um, I would still say that the people who think smoking does not cause cancer are wrong. I would also go further and say that there's a set of climate change issues, right? The consensus is that climate is changing because of um, uh, human, human induced um, climate change is a real thing. If you don't believe that, you're wrong. Uh, right, I wouldn't. I wouldn't unpack that much more than that. Said, uh, there is some work on uh, how people perceive the risk of misinformation globally. So, um, among the risks, among the things that people fear, uh, online fraud, um, AI will take your jobs, um, uh, harassment online, misinformation. The, the the fear of being misled is is one of the most important. Uh, global fears across multiple countries. So I do think that um, it's possible for people to be, uh, to be get wrapped up in a story about nationhood or nationalism or any ideological package, but then still fear that somebody somewhere out there is trying to manipulate them online. That's a tough question. It is. <laughs> it is. I'm glad you got it and not me. Um, but it is, I think, this uh, whole idea of this, it sort of gets the post-truth sort of notion. Does it matter in a sense that I think there it is information? If people, I yeah, will they change their mind if you confront them with the objective truth? Perhaps not. And when, where do you go from there? Um, if, if, you know, if the kind of, uh, if the facts don't convince. Um, and we have a, a question actually, uh, which, yeah, so this is interesting. This is Johannes Sprack has question as a question for you um and like many of the questioners has said thanks very much for the interesting presentation um he asks he says you mentioned that disinformation campaigns uh can get people or voters to make decisions based on their gut instinct um and so i suppose he's uh, then saying well how is it that democrats and and democratic parties can tackle this trend so i suppose this is the idea perhaps of the rational them being rational actors in a way trying to talk about issues um and is it the case that, you know, they're sort of feeding the issues and then the disinformation campaigns are appealing on emotion? Mm -hmm. um, you know, is there something that the parties can do to help kind of rebalance things? I think I can offer a couple of answers to this, at least one of which you won't like. Um, the first is that uh, Democrats and Democratic parties can um, perfect the craft of good argument, right? Of using evidence, you doing evidence-based policymaking of course, it's sort of a name that we even need a term evidence-based policymaking, but this is a trend and, and getting parties to do evidence-based policymaking is, is one of the things that you can do to, to tackle the problem of misinformation. The other, I think, uh, the other thing we can do is, is have people on, on the left and in the center and on the right agree to campaign rules that they all agree to follow. Right, so uh, finance tracking rules in this country, the Electoral Commission um, is a, a fairly robust organization that is understaffed and has a limited ability to fine. Um, politicians won't vote to increase the fines on politicians uh, for the most part. But, but if all the parties agree to electoral campaign rules and abide by them, uh, that's that's the way to build a democratic process. One of the challenges we found is that it's usually, and it's not small C conservative parties, it's ultra right, ultra conservative parties, white supremacist extremist parties that will break this sort of shared understanding about what a civil debate looks like or, or what, a, what a, a clean campaign, even a relatively clean campaign looks like. The third answer, the one, the third part of this answer that might not everybody like, is that Democrats and dem Democratic parties could start to play the game too, right? To, to, could could force, force the platforms to do more get out the vote campaigns, uh, to force them to provide the high quality, credible information that comes from technocrats and health professionals say on COVID. Um, people should not be looking to politicians for health information. 
we should be looking for, uh, you know, to the nation's top doctors. And we could require that the platforms direct, con um, you know, direct information in that way. That's, that's more heavy handed, but, um, and I'm not, I'm not fully advocating for it here. I would just offer that, that out foreign actors and some domestic players are, um, are taking, they're gaming the algorithms. They're taking advantage of the system. And, you know, the, I can see an argument for a stronger defense that, that might involve using some of these tools to, to try and protect democratic values. Mm. Okay, I think uh, that's most of the questions. And actually, I, I just, I think we're, well, we're finishing at 2.30, but I have a question, actually a final question perhaps for you, Phil, but um, uh, it's a uh, one that I've been meaning to ask you <laughs> uh, over time. And it's just a kind of broader question, perhaps about the direction politics is going as this kind of artificial intelligence sort of model mm -hmm. of, of politics uh, develops. And I was just thinking, building on what you've been saying today, and just that last question actually about this direction. So one direction seems to be that it kind of goes towards a more kind of emotional, irrational, you know, the rise of unreason and sort of extremism. And if you like, it's even more politicized. So the sort of the greater application of, 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 of artificial intelligence and digital technologies and politics is pushing us in this sort of hyper politicized uh, state. Mm -hmm. And there's a sort of alternate you could argue, which is perhaps, and I was reading a, a, an edited volume the other day where one of the arguments that was being made was the idea that, that technology actually is, is actually the, is, is pushing us towards a more depoliticized or apoliticized environment. And the, mm -hmm. the more politics is done through AI, the more it's actually um, kind of removing the contingencies and they're kind of um, the basis of what we think, you know, political action is based on, you know, we, mm -hmm. we, we sort of think we can change things and, and increasingly sort of the application of technology and AI may be pushing us towards situations where it's actually, you know, the data rules and, and AI algorithms rule and it's not about political decisions. And so it's just occurred to me in a way that there's a sort of two directions that you could argue both, I suppose. Um, and I just wanted to sort of say, to ask you in terms of reflecting on perhaps those two directions, what, what, you know, in your work, I know you've kind of covered sort of both angles in a sense. So what would you say is, you know, will they coexist? So we'll see it sort of branching out in both directions or will one sort of tend to kind of tip the balance? Yeah. I know it's a broad question, but I'm just, I know. I'm, I'm, happy, to, I'm happy to try, but, but then I, I, again, I'd be interested in, in your take on this too. Yeah. Um, I think, uh, I think that we are entering, a, we have entered a mode of political life in which the um, fundamental data of, of political expression is um, behavioral data collected through our devices, not uh, attitudinal data or aspirational data um, collected over surveys or through voting, right? So the, the, we used to get lots of information about what people's attitudes towards things or what they want for democracy, what they want for politics for the next four years or five years. Um, that stuff is a, is a relatively blunt instrument. We were talking earlier about blunt instruments. The, the survey data, even when, when um, you spend an entire summer crafting the questions, I mean, they, they have to be really well structured to be able to make your good evidence and your good inferences. Um, and when set into contrast with the behavioral data that actually does demonstrate you did vote, not, you don't have to rely on self-reported voting data, which is always you know, 25 points off the actual mark uh, in the US context. Um, you have the behavioral data, you have the location of somebody's in physical, physical in space, you know what magazines they bought and you can develop fairly sophisticated models of, of income based on television choice. I mean, there's a, there's a whole range of things that you can get out of this behavioral data. Now, of the things that I'm concerned about for the next few years, I would be concerned about uh, data sharing or leakage between two types of firms, a firm that manufactures mostly devices like Samsung, and a firm that is mostly social media like Facebook. Right? It would be that marriage of content that we produce with the behavioral and tracking data that come from the devices and that that stuff is both the that's the data that would provide um, 
very fluid opportunities for political manipulation. And there's already enough behavioral research, research to um, be able to say, you know, women voters respond well to uh, somebody with a deep voice and, and male voters respond well to a female prompt, you know, prompt with a woman on a video with a female with a high pitched voice. There's enough cues like that and um, around race and gender um, that, that I think AI may, may hone that ability to create and present messages. That, that'd be what I'd offer. What, what would you say? I think, uh, I think if I, before we got talking about the emotion side, I think, you know, I was kind of more thinking of the tech, the technology as the kind of a depoliticizing sort of trend and sort of seeing as that as perhaps the dominant trend. But I wonder now if actually it is a kind of twin track in a way and both processes are happening. And perhaps, you know, in a, in a way, neither one is is productive of, I don't know if you like to say real politics or mm -hmm. politics that can lead to proper sort of change, you know, a sort of democratic kind of uh, protest. And so it's a, maybe maybe the real, you know, the politics is sort of going to get drowned out as these two extremes perhaps emerge on the one hand, driving emotional and sort of more unreasoned kind of responses and then the other kind of sort of routinizing and kind of automating politics perhaps at the governmental level mm. and and this kind of area of real you know real i don't know i can't put it any better but authentic politics if you like is yeah. sort of squeezed out or what we know has, has been authentic politics um i don't know it's something which i as you can tell i've just uh it's occurred to me i need to think it through but um yeah thanks if, thanks if for the, that if the if the only organizations that have access to that data are large US-based technology firms, then, then that's bad for democracy and public life. Mm. If, if civil society groups can also have a taste, if you and I, if researchers can have a taste and, and catch some of these things, if there's a way of sharing, the best information on public life isn't in the public hands. And I, I just don't, uh, I don't see a way of restoring the public uh, to health in, until that, until we have some get our taste right yeah and that is a kind of demo yeah so the data the sources of data the democratization of that is important um as part of this agenda is is almost like open access um yes yeah very is much. is part of this or like, know, li ensuring like libraries right or yeah the infrastructure of libraries it's a it's yeah. fundamental infrastructure for democracy oh, that's thank you <laughs> write that down Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. I think uh, we actually we. I think we're out of questions. If anybody has any, a couple of people have got to leave. So they've just said thanks very much for the presentation. Um, I guess I'll echo that, uh, Phil. I don't know if you have any final points uh, that you wanted to make or ready to. We we we're ready to wrap up. Um, yeah. So I just well, I'll just say thank you very much for a stimulating talk, uh, Philip. And um, I hope this is not the, the, the last one that you'll, that you'll give at Manchester, although I do hope perhaps in terms of virtually, it'd be nice at some point to host you in, in, in person uh, if you can make it up to Manchester next time. Um, but thank you very much for a really stimulating talk and thank you to everybody for, for joining for the, uh, for the session. Um, and I think uh, we'll draw it to a close at this point. So I'll give a virtual clap. Uh, and show thank your appreciation you. to Philip. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.